Welcome. I'm Dr. Courtney. My family likes to go sledding. We like to come here to Toboggan Hill. Even under conditions like today, where there's snow on the slope but no snow at the bottom. That makes for a high coefficient of friction between the sled and the grass, but it's worth it. This is one of those physics problems that can be solved in more than one way, and it's advantageous to take a moment to think about what might be most advantageous. As the child is sledding down the hill, we're trying to compute the velocity at the bottom of the hill. That could be done using kinematics, but in this case it's to our advantage to use energy methods. So we're going to use conservation of energy to find out how fast the child is going at the bottom of the hill, but then what? Then friction is introduced as the child hits a rough patch and we are asked to compute how far the child moves. So we're talking about converting that kinetic energy at the bottom of the hill over a distance where a force is opposing that motion. So that sounds like work energy, doesn't it? So we're going to also use the work energy theorem to compute how far the child slides And what are we given? We are given the coefficient of friction, the kinetic coefficient of friction at the bottom. And are we given any other quantities? Oh yes, we're given the height of the hill. And that's it. That doesn't sound like much, does it? But we can go forward and draw a diagram and make a plan and see if there's other information we might need to get. So the child begins at the top of the hill. At the bottom of the hill there's a rough patch. So initially the child is here on the sled. At the bottom of the hill the child has some velocity and then at the end the child has come to a stop because this patch is rough. We're told that the hill itself is frictionless so we could say mu1 is zero. But we're told that this rough patch has a high coefficient of friction of 0.53. We're told that this height of the hill is 8.2 meters. At first the child is on top of the hill, not moving. So V1 is zero. However, the height then, H1, is not zero. It's 8.2 meters. How about at step two? At step two, we have a V2 of something that we don't know. We have to figure that out. Now its height is zero. In step three, we have V3 is zero because the child on the sled has come to rest, and that height is also zero. As we make our plan, the first step is to recall conservation of energy. So that means that both the kinetic energy and the potential energy, that sum is constant. We can do that on the hill because there is no friction. So there is not energy being lost to friction. Then we're going to express those terms in the conservation of energy in terms of the mass, gravitational acceleration, height, velocities, etc. And from that calculation, we are trying to compute V2, or the velocity at the bottom of the hill. Once we have that, we can recall the work energy theorem. And the work done by the force of friction opposing the motion of the child can be expressed on the left side. So we're going to express that net work in terms of uh, frictional force and the distance traveled. And in turn, we're going to need to express that frictional force in terms of the coefficient of friction, mu, and the normal force acting on the sled. 
Once we've computed that, we are also going to express the change in kinetic energy in terms of uh, V2 and V3 and the mass. So let's solve for that distance symbolically and then we'll substitute values to compute and then compute it. And finally we'll consider how many significant figures we should use in reporting our answer. So we'll call that K1 which is the child at the top of the hill plus the potential energy at the top of the hill equals the kinetic energy at the bottom of the hill plus the potential energy at the bottom of the hill. So the initial kinetic energy is one half m times velocity one squared. The initial potential energy is gravitational potential energy, mgh. That's going to be equal to one half the mass times the velocity at the bottom of the hill squared plus mgh2. I should call this mgh1. As we've already noted, height 2 is 0 and velocity 1 is 0 and h2 is 0, so those terms are 0. We can also observe that the mass in these two uh, terms cancel with each other and so we are left with g height 1, height at the top of the hill, is 1 half v2 squared. And we're solving for that velocity at the bottom of the hill. So v2 is going to be the square root of 2gh1. We shouldn't substitute numbers in there yet. We're going to go ahead and use this expression symbolically when we get to the work energy theorem. So where are we in our plan? This was step two. Step three was to compute V2, which we've done. Now we are ready to recall the work energy theorem, and that says that the net work done on an object is equal to the change in kinetic energy of that object. So the net work is expressed as the force vector dotted with the displacement vector, and the kinetic energy means the final kinetic energy minus the initial kinetic energy, which in our case is the kinetic energy in step three minus the kinetic energy in step two. So let's write that. The dot product of the force and the displacement vector can be expressed uh, as follows. The magnitude of the force vector times the magnitude of the displacement times the cosine of the angle between the directions of those vectors. What is that angle? Well, it is the angle between, in this case, as the sled travels in this direction, the force of friction is acting against the direction of motion. So the angle between the force and the displacement vector is 180 degrees. So the cosine of that angle is negative 1. And so the magnitude of the force will have negative 1 times the frictional force times the displacement is equal to the change in kinetic energy. What is the frictional force? That we can express as the coefficient of kinetic friction times the normal force times the distance. And what is the normal force? The normal force is the vertical force acting on the sled and since we are not on an angle anymore that is just equal to the mass of the sled times gravitational acceleration. So we can rewrite this as the co negative the coefficient of kinetic friction times the mass of the sled times gravitational acceleration times the distance the sled travels. And now let's go ahead and express um, the kinetic energy in terms of quantities that we know. So on the left side now we have the kinetic energy 
in step three is zero because v3, the velocity at the end, is zero. So we have zero minus the kinetic energy in step two, which is one half mv2 squared. Now we spent some time computing what v2 is, so let's substitute that. We have the square root of 2gh quantity squared. And you can see that the square root and the square uh, leave us with just 2gh, but I wrote that for completeness. Let's go ahead and simplify now. At the same time, let's divide through by negative 1. So now we have mu k, mass, gravitational acceleration and distance, equals 1 half m times 2gh. And the 1 half and the 2 cancel. So let's simplify this expression. We can divide through by the mass. Whew, that's a relief. They didn't give us the mass. And 1 half times 2 is just 1. And gravitational acceleration appears on both sides. And we have that the distance, which is what we're looking for. Let's go ahead and divide through by the coefficient of kinetic friction as well. That leaves us with the distance equals the height. I should have specified which height that was. That was height 1 over the coefficient of kinetic friction. Wow, now that seems simple after all that, doesn't it? All we have to do now is put our numbers in. We need the height, which was 8.2 meters over the coefficient of kinetic friction, which was 0 0.53. And the coefficient of friction is a unitless number. And that gives us an answer of 15.4717 meters. Let's consider our given values. These were to two significant figures, and so our answer will also be it to two significant figures. So the child slides 15 meters over the rough patch. Ah, so this was also step eight here. This was our step nine. It went so quickly, it went right by me. Before we leave this problem, let's consider whether our answer makes sense. One of the first things to check is our units. And in this case, since we worked symbolically and so many terms canceled, that's a very simple process. The height is given in meters, and the coefficient of kinetic friction is unitless. And so we end up with meters for a distance, as we would expect. And then the second thing that you can do is think about uh, the magnitude of the coefficient of kinetic friction. That implies that the normal force, or that the frictional force, which was the coefficient of friction times the weight, that means that about half the weight of the child goes into the frictional force opposing the child's motion. And so we do expect the child to slide some distance. This is not quite twice the distance of the, of the height of the hill. And that makes sense when you're hitting a rough patch on the bottom. I wouldn't expect the child to have stopped in one meter, nor would have I expected the child to stop uh, 100 meters down. So given this coefficient of friction, which is rather high, especially for a sled on a surface, and checking our units, we have confidence that our answer does make sense.